that have a praise after all we've been through. It cannot compare with where we're going to. God has a special place for us. He has a grace for us, a race for us, a pace for us. And he has also a space for us. He has not forgotten you. And let's go directly into prayer and ask God to bless our time together. And we have so much we want to share with you as we bring this series to a close. I am full and filled with revelation, and I believe that it's going to transform your life. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we stop to say thank you. We decree and declare that without you, we are nothing. We thank you for the day that we discovered that there was more to life than just a living. Hallelujah. From, from, from a Monday to, to, to Sunday, we discovered that there was a kingdom. We discovered that there was a king, and we discovered that we were children of the king. And this is the greatest discovery ever. And we discovered that our king, our father, left a gift of eternal life for which we are grateful. Father, you did not leave us in our sin, but you forgave us, you cleaned us up, and Father, you en engrafted us into your, in, into your family, whereby we are able to cry out, Abba, Father. Even as jo Jesus taught us how to pray, he said when you pray, pray our Father. We call you our Father, and you are a good, good Father. Now, Father, Father, we pray tonight that you would anoint me. Let the heavens be open. Give us a fresh anointing. Let the oil on my head be fresh. I decree, Father, that you would give me articulation of speech, that you would think through my mind, that you would speak through my lips, that there will be none of me and all of you. And so I willingly decrease so that you may increase. Bless the hero, O oh God. Hallelujah. Give them revelation. Let the eyes of their understanding, hallelujah, be enlightened. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let the anointing break yokes. Let the anointing lift burdens. Let the anointing sever. Hallelujah. Ties with an old season as you usher us into a new season. Give us clean hands and a pure heart. Father, we decree and declare that no one will be left like they came. That there will be transformation. That we will receive direct downloads and understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Let the heavens be open in the name of Jesus. And in advance, we thank you for the healing. In advance, we thank you for the deliverance. <clears throat> In advance, we thank you for the breakthrough. In advance, we thank you for the understanding. In advance, we thank you for salvation. Father, we give you praise. We give you honor and glory because no one can come into your presence and leave the same. Let your presence be felt. Permeate the room that we are standing in. Permeate the room that we are sitting in. Permeate the vehicle we are driving in. Permeate the environment that we live in. Father, I decree and declare a shift is going on right now. I decree an economic shift. I decree a psychological shift. I decree a shift in our health. I decree an economical shift. I decree an environmental shift. I decree a shift in government, a shift in our community, a shift in industry, a shift in our leadership. I decree right now now we are getting our ability, hallelujah, to see again. We will not be blinded by disappointment. I decree and declare you are showing us a path through, hallelujah, our greatest challenge. You are showing us a way out of our bondage. Let your light shine. Let there be light in every situation. I decree, oh God, we are coming through this season, but we are coming through more than a conqueror. I speak victory into the hearts of those that are listening. I decree they will dream again. They will hope again. We know that hope deferred maketh the heart sick. I decree 
see that the mental sickness and the emotional sickness is being healed right now. The assignment of the spirit of depression is over. We decree, O oh God, that you are lifting our souls and our hearts out of a dark place. I speak, let there be light in the name of Jesus. Now bless us, Father, as we pray in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory to God. Well, let's go directly into the word of God as we invite you into our to our text in the book of Luke chapter 15. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 21. I want to read it in its entirety. Uh, this particular text is very pregnant with revelation, and we could probably preach an entire year on it. But we want to focus on <clears throat> our topic. We've been talking about spiritual maturation and the seven stages of spiritual maturation we are on the eighth stage now the our eight stages of spiritual maturation and we are on the eighth stage the book of luke chapter 15 verse 11 to 21 scripture says and he said a certain man had two sons the younger of them said to his father father give me the portion of goods that fall to me and he divided unto them his living and not many days after, the young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. I decree and declare this is the last season of waste. You are not going to waste your time. You're not going to waste your energy. There is going to be no emotional waste, no spiritual waste. Your season and your days of a wasting is over. I decree a season of gathering. I decree you're going to be in a gathering the blessing of the Lord. I decree that which flowed from you last season is going to flow back to you as a harvest and only good things are going to come to you in this season. The Bible said that he wasted uh, his, his, his resources. He wasted it in riotous living. You know, when you fail to have a vision for your life, that any, then any wind that blows towards you, you'll just be swept away with the currents of that wind. And a lot of times we underestimate the power of a vision. A vision not only helps you to establish goals, not just for the year or for a season, but also weekly goals and daily goals so that you know what to say no to. Because if you have the ability to say no to the wrong thing, you're going to be in empowered to say yes to the right thing. And there are some opportunities that is going to come to you. And they're going to come swiftly and you have to be prepared for that. God is a God of vision. He knows the end from the beginning and everything in between. And I decree that you are going to be a visionary. You are not only going to have downloads as to God's original plan and purpose for your life but also for your children's life. And for your children children life and you're going to be able to speak into their lives until you provoke their future you are not only going to prophesy it you're going to provoke the future of the next generation and we're not talking about flaky prophecy here we're talking about individuals that have heard from God that has received downloads concerning concerning times and season and that there's a level of maturity where we are now speaking to the next generation and this is what God wants. He wants individuals that are mature enough and blessed enough and prosperous enough that they do not have to pay, pray for their own prosperity or pray for their own success or pray for their own breakthrough. They will be praying for the success and prosperity and the breakthrough of the next generation. And I'm decreeing and declaring you are going to be amongst them. You are going to be used by God to touch another generation. What we need need in this generation we need leadership and leadership is not just for some of us it's for all of us because leadership is about influence 
All of us have spheres of influence. Influences. You're either leading or you are following. I decree that you will follow Jesus, but you will be a leader in your family. You will be a leader in your community. You will be a leader professionally in your industry. I decree that you are not following any longer. It's time for you to rise and shine. For God's light has come and his glory is risen upon you. You've got to see yourself as God sees you. He called you the head and not the tail. He called you first and not last. He called you above only and not beneath. Your days of living on the bottom is over. Your days of living on the top, living in realms of dominion, living in realms of influence. I decree that God now is establishing a new paradigm of leadership in your life life, not only in your life, but in the life of your family. I decree that your children will no longer be followers. I decree they will be leaders. They will be industry leaders, ethical leaders, moral leaders. I establish it. I decree it. I declare it. I quicken it. I call it to life by the word, by the blood, by the spirit. I decree that as your children follow Christ, others will follow your children and your children will no longer be pressured by peer pressure. I decree they're going to defy the status quo. They will not be a statistic. They will not be addicts. They will not be alcoholics. They will not be derelicts. I decree your children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be their peace. I decree that when people look for leaders, they will look and they will find your children. I decree even in the educational system and in the school, I decree... <coughs> that your children are leading academically. I decree that they are ten times smarter than their contemporaries. I decree the anointing of Daniel upon them. They will matriculate through the best of schools. They will be hired in the best of, of, of professions and they will rise to the top, hallelujah, in a meteoric way like Joseph. I decree in the, in the name of Jesus that you are rising to the top. You will no longer be satisfied with being on the bottom, in the back, in the corner, in the booth, in the dark. I decree you are stepping out of the clutter of the common and you are finding yourself in a position as a problem solver, a history maker, an agent of change. I decree that this generation shall record your name. I decree that you are the best in the industry and that you are applying the necessary discipline to make you the best. I decree that you are giving your mind the education it needs, your heart, the worship it needs, your soul, the healing it needs. <clears throat> I decree it and I declare it and it shall be so. Clap your hands and begin to praise God. Amen. The Bible said that he had spent all and there was a shift in the economy, a mighty famine, the scripture says, in the land. And he began to be in want. Your days of begging are over. Your days of being in need are over. I decree that God is supplying all your need according to his riches and glory. Not just your temporal needs and your spiritual needs. I decree he's supplying your, your physiological needs, your social needs, your mental needs, your psychological needs. I wish I had somebody in here that would say amen. Hallelujah. I'm talking to you. Amen. I'm not talking around you. I'm not just talking with you. I'm talking talking to you and I'm addressing the history makers. Is there a history maker here? I feel like God wants me to prophesy this over your life. You are going to be the first generation millionaire. I decree it, I declare it, I prophesy it, I establish it, I legislate it by the word, by the blood, by the spirit. I have spoken it and it cannot be otherwise. I decree we are the first generation millionaires. Yes. 
Glory to God. You're going to access your inheritance in this season. Shout, I access it. Shout it, I access it. Yes. The Bible said he joined himself to a citizen of the country, uh, of, of that country. In other words, he was pitching in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in another realm and where his citizenship was not. So that means that we can live in the best of two worlds. <clears throat> God can send you into the kingdom of darkness, but you don't have to be controlled by it. You could prosper in it, but you don't have to be controlled by it. You are a citizen of the kingdom of light. That means that you have to dress like it, act like it, talk like it, walk like it. You've got to worship like it. When they see you, they should smell wealth and dignity. They should see the best and the brightest. They should see that you're from a different country, a different realm, a different region, a different kingdom. They should ask you, where are you from? And you should be able to say, I'm an ambassador sent into this kingdom to represent the kingdom of light. Hallelujah. How many of you know that we are ambassadors? <clears throat> but he joined himself to the citizen of that country. The citizen of that country did not carry his DNA. A lot of us are connecting and networking with people that do not have our DNA. And this is why we're frustrating. This is why we are struggling. People that have your DNA will help to uh, cr help to take you to the next level. People that don't have your DNA are going to fight with you and try to change you so that you look like them. I don't understand <coughs> why a person who's a Lamborghini would want to be a Toyota. There's nothing wrong with a Toyota if that's what you've been made to do. But if you're a Lamborghini, why would you want to just roll up into <coughs> a shop that specializes in, in, in Toyotas. You know, there is a shop that specializes in uh, Lamborghinis. There are mechanics specifically uh, uh, trained with expertise in, in knowing uh, how to fix a Lamborghini. You know, if you go into the Toyota shop, shop they're going to say you're too loud, you're too fast, you've got too much horsepower, and you got your leather seats should be pleather seats, you know. <clears throat> And they're going to tell you what you are not. And a lot of times we are hanging around people that don't have our DNA and don't have the capacity for where we are going. And it is important for you to understand that there is someone in this universe or a group of people in this universe that has your DNA. And when you find them, your baby's going to leap. Your spirit is going to leap. You're just going to know because they're going to welcome you in. They're not going to want you to dumb down. They're going to challenge you to become the best that God wants you to be. And so we know he, he was uh, with the wrong citizens of that country because they did not know who he was, his capacity and value, so they devalued him. They, instead of elevating him, they sent him into a realm that he should never, he was never wired to live in, prosper in, and succeed in, and that was the pig's pen. Jews don't touch pigs, they don't eat pigs, they don't play with pigs, they don't mess with pigs, because is not in their DNA. Are you with me? It's not a part of their laws. They're the laws that govern eating, their nutritional laws or their social laws. That means that he had to deviate and uh, deviate from God's original plan and purpose. And so whenever you are connected to the wrong people, you always live in the realm of deviance. You always live in the realm of deviance. You're taking this detour. Instead of going straight to the realm of prosperity, you end up deviating and it defaulting into the realm of poverty. Instead of going in, you know, in straight into the realm of success, you deviate and, and that path defaults into the realm of failure. And so what God wants to do, he wants to bring alignment. And there's a way that he brings alignment to your life and we're going to find out in a minute. Verse number 14, it says that when he had spent all again there arose a famine in the land and he began to be in want and he went and joined himself to the cities of uh, the citizen of the country and and, the, and the, that citizen took his personal power away from him because the younger son gave it away and so he allowed someone other than himself to make a decision 
for his future and for his destiny. And so he, he took him and told him what he wasn't. He devalued him and he accepted it for a season. I decree and declare you will no longer accept people devaluing you. <laughs> people that devalued you last season is going to turn around and come back and say, I'm sorry, I didn't know who you were. Because they're going to be forced to esteem you, to celebrate you. They're going to be forced to, to, to hold you in the highest of esteem. They're going to be for, forced to respect you. And people that disrespected who you were last season because you didn't know who you were this season, you're going to know who you are, and that's going to force them to see you and respect you from that, from that realm. The Bible said that he would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he had come to himself, he said, so where was he? When he came to himself, so where was he before he came to himself? Here's the question. Who is controlling your soul? Because whoever controls your soul controls your destiny. Whoever controls your soul controls your money. Whoever controls your soul controls your relationship. Whoever controls your soul controls your health. Whoever controls your soul controls your destiny. Who controls your soul? Your soul should take the light in the Lord. Amen. I will bless the Lord, oh, my soul and all that is within me. Whoever controls your soul controls your destiny. Amen. And so here was this citizen who did not know who he was controlling his destiny. But then he came to himself. In other words, he took back his personal power and he took back his personal power at his lowest point. You've got to understand that all of us are going to have a pig pen experience. This is where you're going to get to your lowest point, and it's at that point where you are going to be forced to make a decision. Now, a lot of us tap out of life when the pressure gets hard, and we shift our gear into neutral. But when you fail to make a decision, you have already made the decision not to make the decision, which is a decision. So since you made a decision not to make a decision, what if you make a decision to make a decision to be in a better place? Because you were always one decision away from being where you want to be if you just had the courage to make a decision. Now, when you make a decision, it will inconvenience most people, but they will be temporarily inconvenienced but permanently blessed. Take your personal power back and make a decision. Now, that word decision, decision, D, remove, decision, comes from a Latin word, sedir, and it's translated to cut, out of which you get the word incision. It means to cut into. Decision means to cut away from. It means that every morning you wake up, you have to make decisions. And when you wake up, you wake up to a world of unlimited possibilities and potentiality. It means that you have unlimited options to choose from. But the moment you make a decision, all our other options, uh, options collapse, and it is cut away from the equation of your life. And that single decision brings to you in equal form by way of an experience or an encounter or a manifestation that thing that is equal to the decision that you made. So everything rises and falls on a decision. And you make decisions every single day. Life doesn't have to be as it is because you have the power of choice. You could decide what you want or what you don't want. You could si decide who you're with or who you're not going to be with. You could decide to be happy or not to be happy. You could decide to be healthy or not healthy. You could decide to be powerful or not to be powerful. You could decide to keep that, that couch that you hate and you've been hating it for 20 years and you walk in your house every single day to say, I hate this couch. Do something about it. Nothing about your life has to remain the same. I prophesy you are going to make decision and tomorrow about this time everything about your life is going to be better. It's going to be changed. Why? Because I decided to. To make a decision today where you're going to go. I remember, I remember living in Florida, and I was having a birthday. I can't remember what birthday it was. I'm 21, so it had to be my 18th birthday. And I was with just a few close friends, and I sat there. And when I sat there, I had this revelation. And I turned to them. I said, this is the last day my life is going to be in this state. 
365 days from today's day, everything about me is going to be changed for the best. And 365 days, it was almost overnight. God began to connect the dots. I became, within that year, I became a best-selling author. I'd never wrote a book before. I became a best-selling author. And then I began to make decisions. My life began to change. I began to write visions that were very, very clear where I wanted to be, 12 areas of writing a vision, where I wanted to be. And I'm telling you, I'm walking it out right now. The most amazing things happen when you make a decision. Yeah. Last year, I wrote a bucket list, uh, things that I wanted to achieve before I die. One of the things I wanted to achieve before I died, I said, I'm definitely going to Dubai. And I made that decision last December when I wrote my goals for this year. Then I wrote when I was going to go to Dubai. I was going to go for the end of the year. Listen, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine said, listen, I'm going to give you a birthday gift. I said, cool. She said to me, you want to fly to Dubai? <laughs> Where does your future come from? It comes from past decisions. You've got to make some decisions. Where do you do you want to keep living like you're living right now? No. Do you want to keep feeling like you're feeling? No. Do you want to have the same financial struggle? Do you want the same people keep attracting to you? What do you want? Do you want to be overweight like you are? Or do you want to be smaller? You know, you made the decision to put that last Twinkie in your mouth. And it was supposed to be the last. But you said it was the last last year. You said it was the last the year before. Can I get a sure you're right? Because if you say an amen tonight, you are going to expose yourself. You said that's the last Big Mac I'm going to have. That's the last French fry I'm going to have. This is the last time I'm going to overeat. This is the last ice cream, the last potato chip, and you said that last year, and you said it the year before, but tonight I decree where you are will not last any longer. Tonight is the last of the last. The last of the last. Turn to your neighbor, give her a high five, say, and I mean it. I'm making a decision. Nothing about, tell them, nothing about my life is going to remain the same. Nothing. 365 days from today's day, everything about me is going to change for the best. Call your friend on the telephone. Tweet them, text them, Facebook them. Make the declaration and say, I make the decision. Glory to God. Bible said nobody gave to him. If you're waiting for someone to make your life better, you're going to be waiting until the rapture. If it's, up, if it's going to be, it's up to me. And I make a decision. That's it. They just have to be inconvenient. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> when he came to himself, he said, what does your internal dialogue look like you see we make these external declarations but is your internal dialogue is your internal conversation that is driving your decisions that's driving your actions what are you saying to yourself for the last year I've been repeating this one prayer every morning when I w awaken and I'm telling you that prayer it's only uh, 14 minutes and 58 seconds not even 15 minutes. And I've been saying this prayer for one year, and I decided to say it a whole nother year. You could go online. You could download it. All you have to do is download the app. When you download the app, it will hyperlink you into the school store. When you get into the store, you see a free prayer there, the prayer of success. And that prayer has done so much. It opened doors for me to study at uh, Oxford University. Today, we just uh, brokered a multi-million dollar contract. It's amazing what's going on. And, and, and it's because not only are we praying and not only are we prophesying, we are also making the right decisions. We're making, what are you saying to yourself? What are you repeating to yourself over and over? Get the promises of God, play them, repeat them until they become the, 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 the map or the uh, GPS that guides you through, through, through uh, your life. 
and you want a spiritual GPS, and what better GPS to have than the Holy Spirit along with the promises of God, as well as the law, the laws of God and the laws of the Spirit. It, it, it'll revolutionize your life. He said to himself, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to eat and spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. I will arise and reconnect. I disconnected. I made a decision to remove, to cut away, to remove by cutting away. I made a decision to disconnect from my progenitor, from the source and the force of my destiny, the one that was assigned to, to build capacity, the one that was assigned to build character. But because I was grown, I disconnected and I broke a covenant and I didn't allow my father to fulfill the covenant that was a part of his assignment in my life. I aborted my own destiny because I walked away from a divine covenant. I aborted my own destiny. It wasn't the devil. It was a decision I made. Right, right, right. Some of the people that you're assigned to and assigned to you are assigned to build capacity for where you're going, not capacity to keep you where you are. And when the pressure comes upon most people, that's when they run. Because it's a lot of discomfort. It means that you have to change. And your brain is going to fight change. Your brain is going to fight change. Your mind, your spirit knows you have to. But as soon as pressure comes, it's so uncomfortable. And your brain is going to reach back to old experiences and tell you that the very person that is assigned to you is like everybody else. There are some of us that are not like everybody else. I'm not like your mother. I'm not like your cousin. I'm not like your, 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 your demon-possessed supervisor. Are you with me? That ain't me. My assignment is to get you from point A to point B. And you can only do it when someone tells you the truth. You can only do it when someone can see greatness in you and see the capacity that you have and forces you to see it and own it and take 100% responsibility for developing it. And it takes a whole lot of discipline. When God assigns someone to your life, they are not assigned to like you. They are assigned to love you into destiny. And sometimes it takes tough love. Sometimes they got to tell you what you know you have to hear, but you don't want to hear it. They got to tell you the truth because it's only the truth that will liberate you and free you so that you can fulfill God's original plan and purpose. You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. There are so many people that love deception. And there are, because we live in a world of deception. And when someone tells the truth, it seems so foreign. When someone lives the truth, we want them to conform to a world that is built upon deception. One of the things I've learned, you don't have to be afraid of the, uh, of, of the wolf at the door. You've got to be afraid at the termites on the floor. You should not be afraid of the, of the wolf, wolf at the door. Be afraid of the termites on the floor. I'm going to say it again. When you begin to be mature, you are not afraid of the wolf at the door. Your concern should not be whether there's a wolf at the door. Your concern should be whether there's termites on the floor. And the floor represents your foundation, the thing that you stand on. What is eating away at the foundation? And now what, 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 what the devil is doing is trying to make us over uh, suspicious, looking for wolves in sheep clothing. You would know a wolf in sheep clothing. Why? Because they would have had wool socks, wool hat, <laughs> wool mitten, and they would be serving you curried mutton. <laughs> when the wolf shows up, you're going to know he's a wolf yeah. because he would have or they would have sacrificed some sheep. 
But a father sacrifices himself. A good shepherd sacrifices himself. He does not sacrifice the sheep. He said, look, my father, is I don't know how he provides. All I know is there's food enough to spare. Yes. And he has hired servants. Mm -hmm. And they eat. Obviously, he's feeding them yes. because they, they're not dying. You got to find somebody that feeds your soul, feeds your intellect. You see, most of us uh, have our spirit that is fed, but our minds are dead. Because someone made you check your mind at the door. They don't want you to be dinkers. You see, you know, the Bible said that we are all lights of the world. But you know someone is not a good father when they're the only son and you're a satellite. <laughs> they, you you got to revolve around them. Father is going to cultivate you until you are luminary just like them. A spiritual mother is going to cultivate you until you're a luminary just like them. I'm getting ahead of myself now. Getting ahead of myself. We're talking about the eighth stage of spiritual maturation. That stage is your mother, father. We call it mater, pater. He said, listen, I will arise. Here's my decision. I'm going to reconnect with a covenant relationship going to reconnect with my father, my father. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am and, and, and no more worthy to be called your son. Make me one of thy hired servants. What? I am your son. This is the seventh stage of spiritual maturation, which is we us. Now his father wants to posture him and position him so that he can eventually Become a father like him. So that, that, that particular stage is called weas thesis. It's 7B. Weas thesis means to be son placed. And once you're son placed, you have access now to your inheritance. Weas thesis. It means that when the timing is right, God will bring you your own sons and daughters. Now, when he said... <laughs> You can make me a servant if you want. It means that I trust the God in you. I know that I need governors and tutors. Remember Galatians says that although you're ear, you are going to have to be treated like a servant. And you're going to have to submit to governor and tutor. A tutor is responsible for intellectual capacity, building your intellectual capacity. A governor is responsible for building your uh, uh, character so that you have uh, character, ethics, and morality when you go into the industry, when you fulfill God's original plan and purpose. Uh, it means that you will not only be gifted, but your core values, your morality and ethics will maintain you or help to maintain a place and a posture of influence. You see, when you join church, God didn't tell you to check your mind at the door. Amen. You brought it in. And so the gospel is preached not only to bless your soul, but to build capacity in your mind. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And this is where God wants to take you, wants to bring you back and restore our position, your position, my position of dominion, of dominion. And we'll talk about that in a minute. He said, look, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Verse number 19, make me one of thy hired servants. Now, this is very important. The Bible said that God resists the, resist the proud. But if we would just what? Humble ourselves. God would what? Exalt us. So now what he wanted was the person and not the position. His relationship with his father was more important than possession and position. You see, a lot of sons and daughters want what their father or mother has, not knowing 
that God has something to give them that belongs to them. So you don't want someone else's. You don't want someone else's ministry. You don't want someone else's pulpit. You don't want somebody else's people. What you want is what God has for you because what's for you is for you. You don't want someone else's reputation to write on your resume that you're the son and the daughter of this person and, and you're associated with this person and that person. Well, who are you? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, if, what if those people end up uh, disqualifying themselves and taking themselves into a bad place. Are, are they going to drag you with them? You, you have to have your own brand, your own identity. You've got to be able to stand on your own. Who are you and what are you bringing to the table? And you don't, you don't need to be someone's shadow when God has called you to be the substance. You don't need to be someone's shadow. You don't need to borrow from someone or take from someone. You can, listen, <laughs> you can either be the benefactor or the beneficiary. Which one do you want? You want someone to keep giving you something or do you want to be on the end where you are giving? Amen. And you've got to make that choice. He said, make me a servant. He humbled himself. That means now his father has the right to groom him and build capacity so what he was doing was embracing the process. And there were so many people that run after a position and run after a title. A title is a title is a title. And I see so many business cards of people that uh, claim to be this and claim to be that. And you look behind them and no one's following them. I'm the most of, I'm the super most official Dun Juice Grand Poobah. A First Baptist, Pentecostal, holiness, church of the firstborn going all the way to heaven. Relax. God's going to get you there. Amen. Submission is not the same thing as obedient. You have to be obedient. But there are some people that are obedient, but they're not submitted. Amen. Obedience is an action. Submission is an attitude. It's a mentality. I'm so submitted to my spiritual father. My church is in Chicago. I live in Atlanta. So that means that I, I can't be an usher, an ursha. I can sing on the choir because I live here. So it's, it's not about sitting in the pew and saying amen. It's the attitude that is in your heart. You see what I'm saying? There, was, there are so many people that are passive aggressive. They say yes with their mouth, and then they do whatever they're called to do with, with, with their body, but their mind is so far away from. They've disconnected. Are you with me? Yes. Glory to God. He said, I've got to reconnect to the person that is my progenitor. And when we talk about spiritual fathers, we are also re referring to spiritual mothers. But because the spiritual father is prominent in, in the Bible, I want to stick with spiritual fathers, knowing also I'm referring to any progenitor that includes spiritual mothers as well. He said, I'm no, wor no longer worthy to be called thy son. I take 100% responsibility for my action. That's a sign of maturity. When you're able to take 100% responsibility for everything that's going on in your life, don't say my husband makes you me sick. Take responsibility to say, I do take you as my boo. <laughs> take responsibility for that. Are you with me? Now, you're not responsible for how he treats you, but you are responsible for marrying him. So how he treats you is predicated on the decision that you made to marry him. Now, if he's not treating you like you should be treating, wink, wink. You can make another decision. <laughs> if you're being abused physically, make a decision. <clears throat> the Bible said, verse number 21, very important, and 22. He arose. Arise means I'm going to operate on a higher plane. I'm going to operate on a higher plane. I'm going to operate on a higher plane. He arose. You see, when you submit 
you actually arise. You, when you submit, you're actually elevated in the realm of the spirit. And this is what people don't understand. If you submit to God, you got to submit to someone. And, 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 and your spiritual father or spiritual mother is submitted to God. It means that you can't go wrong. It means that if the devil wants to attack you, the devil has to go through your covering. Has to wipe, totally wipe them out before they get to you. Yes. Submission just makes sense to me. That's why I pray for my covering. I pray for my spiritual father. Why? As long as he's there, he's in place, I'm all right. I'm cool. I could go to bed at night. He could stay up and pray. I could go to bed at night. Are you getting me? Are you getting this? He arose, came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. It means that his father recognized his walk, not only saw him, but it's interesting, was waiting for him. Mm. This, this is, you see, a spiritual father or mother knows their spiritual son or daughter. They know them. Even if their spiritual son or daughter is a Peter, uh, you could say, Peter, Peter, uh -huh. Satan desires to sift you as wheat, to have you and sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you. Why? Because I've already seen you in your finished state. This is just a process that you're going through. I'm not going to change my covenant that I made with you. You can rely on me after you've been converted. Oh, yes, you're saved, but there's got to be a conversion. There's got to be a transformation. I prayed for you, man. I've seen you in your finished state. I've seen you as a powerful uh, apostle. I've seen you open doors to the kingdom to the, uh, with, with the Gentiles and the Jews. I've seen you open the door, brother. I've seen you open the door. I know where you're going to be. But I can't control you. You see, a spiritual parent does not control you. You're a grown adult. You got children of your own. You pay your bill. You don't have to tell me what kind of car you're getting and run up my, you know, cell phone. Uh, 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 what is it? Cell phone what? Yeah, run up my minutes. You see, I don't know about anything running up. I just run it up. <laughs> Pay the bill at the end of the month. This, this is not about controlling you. It's about building capacity in you. And when you build capacity in a person, you cannot take the freedom of choice away from them. They, can be, they cannot be afraid of you. Nor can you be afraid of the process. The process, if they're submitted, the process is going to get them there. Let God be God in their life. We all have to make a decision. And we all learn by trial and error. And we all learn by mistakes. And sometimes they got to go to the pig pen. And they got to hit it hard before they're going to say, I'm ready. I've discovered my way, my strategy. And when they come home, you cannot condemn them. Why? Because you know what it feels like because you had a pig pen experience too. I've had my pig pen experiences. And you're going to have yours too. But you've got to know that when you come up that path, your spiritual mother and father is going to be waiting for you. I knew you were coming back, baby. Now, let's just get on with the process. Like I was saying, saying, <laughs> 10 months ago, before you thought you were grown enough, I was giving you 10 reasons why you shouldn't leave in the sermon, but you didn't hear it. 10 ways to recognize the seduction of the devil. But you, through trial and error, you learn how to navigate the terrain of the spirit through your own experiences because one day, you're going to have children of your own. Yeah. You're going to be a spiritual mother and spiritual father. And you're going to know what this feels like.
The Bible said his father saw him and had compassion. Saw with his eyes the natural compassion, but was moved by the spirit. You cannot be moved by your, just your emotions and your mind. You got to be moved by your heart. And that's the heart of the father. And ran. Oh, my God. He didn't just sit there. <laughs> you going to come to me. No, I'm going to meet you. That's right. You're probably filled with guilt, and that's enough punishment. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to run to you with compassion. Yeah. I decree and declare tomorrow you are scheduled for a head-on collision with compassion. Mm. People that judged you yesterday Jesus. are going to finally understand you are no longer going to be held captive by the spirit of condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation. Just as long as you can be convicted, you don't have to be condemned. Condemnation is about control. Yeah. I had a dream about you. I saw you coming back down the path. The Lord showed me. That's condemnation through control. Whom the sun sets free yes. is free indeed. I don't know the path that God has chosen for you, but God knows the path. And if he's chosen it for you, he's going to get you to the finish line. It may take 40 years in the wilderness, but you're going to get to the promised land. He ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. When, whenever there's kissing, there's covenant. Whenever there's kissing, there's covenant. Jesus had a covenant with the very man that betrayed him. But yet when he saw him, he still kissed him. That's covenant. Covenant has less about, is less about you and more about me. Covenant with a person is all about exposing my character. See, you could do whatever you want. If I cut covenant with you, you could do whatever you want, say whatever you want, but I will never sever the tides of covenant I made with you. Why? Because you serve a God that's covenant maker, covenant keeper. And this is very important. God frowns upon people who break covenant. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I'm going to allow you to do anything and say anything. It might mean that we have to renegotiate the terms now say for instance if someone cheated on their spouse we have covenant yes but i'm renegotiating the terms it's called divorce you're still my brother in the lord but bye <laughs> you're still my brother do you see how it's escalated do you see how you're arising in your thoughts you're my husband now but tomorrow you're gonna be my brother in the lord Lord, and I can pray for you from that dimension. Are you with me? You made a decision. I'm going to make a decision too. Because I don't need no extra gifts now. Hint, hint. Wink, wink. I could do. Bad. That's what Prophetess Medea said. In other words, in spite of what you've done, I have a covenant with you, and I'm going to keep my end of the bargain. The son said to him, Father, I love that. I'm going to reestablish my covenant with you, Father. I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and no longer worthy to be thy son. Let's break this down, sin. Sin comes from this Greek word, harmartia, harmartia. And it is an Olympic word, actually. It's assigned to the dimension of sports, or it's assigned to uh, a sports called archery. So that's a Greek word, harmatia. And it means that you, to miss the mark or to err in judgment or to blow an opportunity to align oneself with the will of God. I like that. Say it. <laughs> to blow an opportunity that aligns you with the will of God. That's what sin is. So the moment you sin, 
you misalign yourself to the will of God. You make a decision. I don't want to align myself with the will of God. What I want to do is to violate the laws of the spirit. And I'm making a decision to violate. So when you violate, you deviate. And when you deviate, it puts you in the realm of deviance. Are you with me? So you're deviating from the law. So instead of us just saying that there are big sins, such as lying and cheating and, and all of that, that we usually relegate people to, let's just say sin is man's attempt to live his life without God. That's what sin is. means that you're making a decision. It means that every time you make a decision, you err in your judgment. You're making the wrong decisions. You err in your judgment. Therefore, sin, here's another definition, is poor life strategies. Poor, bad life strategies. Why? A strategy is attached to a goal, an objective, a vision, or a dream, right? So you want the right strategies to what? Fulfill that goal, objective, or, or vision. Outcome. So whenever you have life strategies and it doesn't give you the outcome you're looking for, you say, I don't, I don't, I don't want to live like this. I didn't want to hurt like this. I, I didn't want to, you know, when you say that, it means that you are admitting that your life strategy is wrong. So why would you want to get up the next morning and apply the same strategy? Because that's what the masses do. They get up and they complain, they bellyache, I don't want to be poor, I don't want to hurt, I don't want anybody to hurt me anymore. But what did they do? The next morning, they get up and they uh, just push the same button that they always push and they use the same strategies they always used. It's like a woman that goes on the diet. And you know that it was those Twinkies. <laughs> And you wake up the next morning and you say, this is my last Twinkie. And then you wake up, the, uh, you have a Christmas party. This is my last Twinkie. And you keep saying, it's my last, it's my last. And then you say, you know, they used to make clothes much larger. They're making clothes smaller. <laughs> They're shrinking. Because you need to justify. What you need to do is admit that your strategy is not working. So when you are born again, God gives you a new life strategy. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away those child. I made the decision to do what? Not pray it away, but put it away. Some things you pray away, others you put away. You just put it away. The strategy is not working. And in order to replace one strategy with another, you've got to give up the other. You've got to give it up. You can't use two strategies at the same time. That's insanity. Give up one and replace it with another. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, even as we lay the foundation for our discourse in uh, spiritual maturation, talking about spiritual fatherhood, we decree and declare that we will have an understanding of the role of, of that we play as sons and daughters. He took 100% responsibility for his action. He was ready to embrace the process, not merely focusing on a position or prestige or power. And I pray, oh God, that even as over the last few months we have been journeying to discover the stages of spiritual maturation. And we have learned that there are eight stages of spiritual maturation. We thank you right now that you are posturing us so that we truly can uh, be matured enough to become spiritual uh, mothers and fathers in the gospel. That we would have an understanding that each one of the stages of maturation has a particular level of authority. And each stage have a rite of passage. And even as we excavate this last stage of spiritual maturation, it has its own characteristics. We thank you now, Father, that you have brought us through an understanding of gaster, an understanding of tikto, an understanding of padion, an understanding of napios. You have given us an understanding of pais. 
You have given us an understanding of technon. You have given us an understanding of we us and we us thesis. And now you bring us into the eighth stage, the stage where we become spiritual mothers and fathers. Give us an understanding of what a true spiritual mother or father looks like so that we can be submitted to a mother and father. Thank you.